begin. There's an unusually large number of people here today. I wonder why that is. So it's midterm week. I'm sure you guys were at home over spring break thinking, I can't wait to get back to beautiful Buffalo so that I can take midterm in 421, 521. Uh, so, but that's what we're going to do this week. So today we'll do review, Wednesday's the exam, and on Friday we will go over the exam and solutions in class. And we will resume our normally scheduled programming next Monday. Uh, as I've announced several times, there are reduced office hours this week, partly because we don't have an assignment out, also partly so that the TAs won't kill me when I ask them to grade 150 exams starting on Friday. So uh, we will probably also have office hours a little skimpy next week as well. I know that assignment three will be out. We'll keep, I think we'll keep to the original schedule, but some of the normal TAs may be busy grading your exams rather than helping you with assignment three. All right, so today what we'll do is we'll go over a couple of practice exams. There are now, I think, five exams posted online, maybe six midterms, two, two, five, I think there are six, actually, so I think there are six previous midterms. There were two years where I gave two exams, last year I gave one, and there was a practice for the first year, so there's plenty of ways to prepare. I would suggest that if you guys uh, want to practice, you sit down with one of these and try to do it in 50 minutes. So uh, it's, it's, these are available. Uh, all the lecture slides are up this year in a nice format, so I feel like you guys have plenty of information to prepare. Um, so anyway, let's just go through the exam. People haven't taken a look at it before. Uh, the first 10 questions are supposed to be quite easy, um, and usually people find them that way. Um, hello. Oh, oh, hello. Okay. Um, Let's forget to do something. All right. Okay. Oh, whoops. My apologies. Whoops, let's see exam. Turn. All right, so the, the, the place where people will probably have the most fun is on the long answer questions. We'll get to those in a minute. Uh, the short answer questions are not a, a, intended to be very difficult, so here's an example. We've talked about several cases where operating systems provide some sort of allusion to processes. What are some examples of these? What's one? Somebody, anybody? Right, so by time slicing the processor, we can make it look like each process has its own CPU. And potentially, we can hopefully make it look to processes like there are many more CPU cores on the machine than the machine actually physically has. So that's one illusion. What's another one? Yeah. Yeah, atomicity, so that's not a bad one. Uh, using synchronization primitives, we can make it look like a single of act, a, a set of actions that actually require doing multiple things that aren't atomic from the perspective of the machine are atomic with respect to the code that's executing. So they, ex they, they sort of complete as a block, right? That's another good one. What's another one? More recent from memory, yeah. What? Yeah, we did concurrency. Got yeah, concurrency, atomicity, what else? Yeah, address spaces. So I'm going to make it look like you have this huge contiguous, you know, 2 to the 31 bytes of virtual address, uh, of memory, right? We know now that those addresses are virtual addresses and that memory isn't necessarily real, but that's the illusion we provide to processes because it's useful, right? Those were probably the answers we were looking for. There may be some other ones as well, all right? Oh, this thing's going to drive me nuts today, isn't it? Okay. Um, uh, okay, so, ah, here we go. I like this question. So, we've, we've talked about, and there, there may be a question like this on the exam. I've written the exam, so I know exactly what's on the exam. Um, so this question is not on the exam, of course, because I never reuse questions, which means, unfortunately for you guys, every year the exams get more and more bizarre, 
right? It's just like stranger and stranger things I have to think of. I'm just kidding. The, the exam this year is fine. It's not bizarre at all. Um, so we, we've talked about how locking shared data structures can cause things to slow down. Ideally, when I have multiple cores, I want things to be able to proceed independently on those cores so they don't get in each other's way. But once I have to grab a lock, effectively what I'm doing is I'm serializing multiple threads that I want to be able to actually execute concurrently. Right? So here's, um, so here's some example code that we gave you. And the question was, how do you change the locking strategy in this piece of code to improve concurrency? So let me scroll down a little bit, show you the code snippet. Um, what's happening here is that there's an array of some structure, and threads are looping. In order to deposit some value into the structure, they're looping through the structure, looking for a value, claiming the value, and writing some data into it. And what they're doing in this code example right now is that they're doing this while they hold some lock that protects the data structure from concurrent accesses. Because if I didn't have a lock, it's possible that two threads would overwrite each other's deposits or would overwrite each other's values. Right? So I want to make sure that every thread finds a unique spot in this data structure to use. Okay? So first of all, what's the problem here? And that the, the, the question also pointed out that you were, you were instructed to assume that this, uh, this array is usually pretty crowded. It's usually have a lot, it has a lot of values in it. So it's unlikely that I'm going to be able to find a value quickly. I'm probably going to have to investigate a couple of different entries. So what's the problem? How is this going to slow things down on a multi-core system? Yeah. Okay, well, we have the beginnings of a solution here, but let's, de let's describe the problem here first, right? So what's the problem? Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so there's, there's one little minor nit here, which is that we're starting from the beginning every time. You know, you could fix that. That's not necessarily going to make a huge difference. Um, but, you know, if, if I had written this a little more carefully, I might have chosen a random index to start at, but that's a great point. I certainly, if I'm putting things in and out of an array to optimize for performance, I don't want to start at the beginning. Um, so, so that's one problem, but, but what's the more fundamental problem with this code? What is, it, what is it doing that we don't want to do? Yeah. Yeah, there's a great answer. There's a big critical section. For performance reasons, we want to keep our critical sections as small as possible. This is looping over a potentially large and crowded array while holding a lock. So the critical section now includes this whole loop, which I told you could potentially take a while to terminate because there may not be very many empty entries in this particular data structure. Okay, so starting with uh, Gila's answer, what, how can I do better? What do I need to do? Somebody give me, yeah. Okay, so, so ideally I want to protect only the right operation. So, so what's one sort of, um, What's one maybe obvious solution that comes to mind? What, what could I do? Rather than having one big lock for the entire table, what else could I do? Right, so I could have a single lock per entry. Unfortunately, the text and your intuition as programmers should push back against that idea a little bit. Why? it's going to cause your array to get quite a bit bigger. Probably at least twice as big, depending on how efficient your locking data structures are. But putting a lock on every entry is not really appropriate. And in fact, the question text instructed you not to do that. Well, it didn't say not do that specifically 
it said, don't dramatically change the spatial requirements for this particular piece of code. Right, so I can't do that. What can I do? I've got to use one. In theory, I'm going to use one lock. That seems like the thing I'm, if I can't use many, I might as well stick with one. But what can I do to optimize the? Use a reader writer lock. OK. I think I could get that to work. I can actually do something that's even simpler. Yeah. All right, so one thing I could do is I could move the lock inside the for loop. So I could only grab the lock when I'm checking the value. So how is this better? It is maybe better. It's not bestest full credit better, but we're going in the right direction. What's better about this? Yeah. Doesn't know. They have three or four threads that are trying to acquire, they're trying to do this simultaneously. What's better about moving it inside the four? Right. So the idea is that if I have multiple threads. I don't have this uh, in, in, in systems we sometimes call this front of the line blocking. So I don't have a guy at the beginning of the line who's spinning through the entire array, holding the lock, and who's preventing everybody behind him from making progress. Instead, what can happen is that multiple threads sort of simultaneously will be moving through the array. So that sounds good, but have I really reduced the size of the critical section here at all? Yeah. Well, no, no, answer my question first. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I want to do this step by step, right? I mean, maybe people see what the answer is, but have I reduced the, if I move the lock to here, right? and I drop it and acquire it every time I move through the array. Have I shortened the critical section? Yeah, Diane. Yeah. Like, the well, remember, I'm grabbing it even before I check anything about the array, right? Yeah, OK, well, let's, we'll, we'll get there, right? But, but one thing is I could put it right after here, which would allow more interleaving, right? So that would improve the ability of multiple threads to search simultaneously. But the total amount of time a thread would have to acquire the lock would still be the same. So what, what can I do, Todd? Um, put it OK, so I can move it inside the if statement. So I take my lock acquire. And I put it here. Now, where am I going to drop the lock? Before the break. Yeah, I could probably drop it actually right here once I'm done modifying the global structure. But whatever, it doesn't really matter. So is this safe? If that's all I do, let's say that all I do is I take my lock acquire, and I put lock acquire here, and I put lock release here or after failed. Again, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Right. How? What can happen? Yeah. Right. I have two threads that essentially simultaneously, they check that a particular index is valid. They're both checking the same index. They both see that it's not valid. Now, one of them grabs the lock and sets it to be valid and stores an entry. And the other one grabs the lock and overwrites the entry that the first guy just wrote. So this is exactly what I didn't want to happen. This solution is essentially equivalent to not using a lock at all. But I've made some progress here. What else do I need to do? Yeah. No, nope. you could, you, you can, but that's, there's a better solution. Yeah. Maybe have a lock where if, if the lock is required by the thread, then you move on to the next iteration. Because okay, I, I, I don't have a new locking structure. I have to use the locks I have. Yeah. Right. So remember, I, it's not safe to rely on the value that's stored inside the shared data structure until I have the lock. 
but that doesn't mean that I can't use that value as a hint. So the, the, the solution here is to move the lock here. Once I grab the lock, I have to recheck valid. So the first thing I do once I get the lock is I have to make sure that valid is still zero. If valid is, has changed, that means that somebody else raced in there and beat me to it, and then I have to break out, drop the lock, and keep looking. But the idea here is that I'm only going to acquire the lock when I think that I've found a valid entry that I can use. Does this make sense? Does anyone have questions about this? Again, as long as I only read the value of valid as a hint, right? This is, I'm only reading it, too. I could never write it without the lock. I cannot modify the shared data structure without the lock. But I can read the shared data structure without the lock as long as I only use it as a hint about when to acquire the lock. So that solution works quite well, right? And in most cases, it reduces the critical section to only a couple of instructions. Any questions about this example? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good point, right? It's, it's possible that if I do it this way, I may need to loop through the array again or do something else to make sure that I haven't, uh, that my hint hasn't failed, right? Um, I'm trying to think about if that actually, I think I'm only going to misfire, though, if it looks like it's free, right? Um, but, but you're right. It's also possible that that value is changing to 1, right? So it's possible that I read it without the lock, and then right after I read it, it changes to 0, and I missed a chance to find that entry. So this is a good point. This may affect the ability of the solution to find a valid entry, right? And I might need to, there might be another way to fix this, right? So for example, I can maintain a count of the number of valid entries in the array to make sure that when I'm finished, if I fail out, I failed out because there's really no space, right? On the other hand, with an example like this, if you think about it, given that there's always items coming in and out of the array, it's always unclear when to stop looking, right? Because even in the first case, when I have a global lock, I might need to drop it, let some people take some items out of the array, and then reacquire it and look again, right? So whenever I have a shared data structure like this, it's always possible I need to wait a little bit, right? Of course, I could use a CV to do that or something. That's a good point. Any other questions about this particular example? But this is a common approach to safely using read access to data structures as a hit, which is read, lock, read again. OK. Yeah. What's that? Right. Yep. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. The idea here is that this will allow multiple threads to search the array simultaneously, right, without having one thread blocking everybody from, from proceeding. All right. OK. All right. Maybe a little bit easier. Three system calls that allocate virtual addresses. Maybe one, fork, two, sec, three, S break, four, M map. There's others. Those are the big ones. And the semantics associated with each, I'll let you guys review that. But this is, you know, some of these are, are pretty much straight from the lecture notes. MMAP. MMAP. Give me some virtual addresses that point to a file. OK, so question five. So this question asks you to think about NUMA. So yeah, Diana. Yeah, like how do they allocate virtual addresses, right? You know, S break, I ask the kernel to move the breakpoint so I can have more heat. That's, that's semantics. What do they do? How do they work? All right, so this question, I'm looking at a NUMA system. So this is something I will commonly ask you guys to do on exams or on midterms, is to think about a system with some properties that are different than the systems that we're using, used to talk about and apply, but apply some of our design principles to these systems. I find these questions fun to write, and I think they're a good chance for you guys to think about how you're actually going to use knowledge in this class in the future, OK? No one is going to ask you, again, 99.5% of you are never going to develop an operating system, ever. 
So how, what's the point of me asking you all these sort of stupid little minutia about operating systems? I want to get you guys to see you guys applying the design principles that you're learning to new problems. Um, so here's an example. I have a NUMA machine. What that means is that the latency associated with accessing memory is non-uniform. So most of the machines you guys are used to thinking about, the memory accesses are relatively late, r relatively uniform. I've got memory, and you know, memory's got some low-level details and things like that, but all else being equal, reading a byte of memory performs identically regardless of the byte of physical memory that I'm actually reading. On a NUMA system, this isn't the case, and there's all sorts of different reasons why this could be true. Memory could be on another machine. Memory might, I might have a system with so many cores that I can't provide the same memory latencies to all of them if memory is literally farther away on the physical chip or something like that. Anyway, the point is that I've got memory, but not all memory on a NUMA machine performs identically for every core. So, and, and imagine that the way this machine is set up is, is described in the question is that I have some memory that's fast and then a larger amount of memory that's slow. So the first thing it asks you is how does the design, this particular design, complicate my address space abstraction? What additional consideration does this introduce into the address space abstraction that processes have not been used to? What was one of the things that, that I liked about the address space abstraction? What, what additional complication does this introduce for, I should look up the statistics. Maybe nobody answered this question. It's too weird. Um, I don't know why. It's not that complicated. Yeah, that's right. That's the, yeah, that is something that we've noticed in the past. The, the smaller the number of people that answer a question, the higher the average is, um, especially with these questions where you can pick multiple ones. Right? Um, yeah? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's not, it's not designed to be a trick question. The idea is now where the OS puts stuff, even when it's in physical memory, matters. So I might have two pages that to the process are side by side, but those pages, even when they're paged in, right? It's one thing to stall a process while I go get a page from disk and move it back into memory. It's another thing where the process, the pages are there, but there's this one page that's slower than the other page. They're both in memory, they're both physically resident, but the performance on those two pages is different. Yeah. So this, the second part of the question, which, which, which I think what you're an answering is, at a high level, describe a way to make use of this NUMA property. And it asks you to use a system design principle that we've talked about it, at a high level. If I have some memory that's fast and some memory that's slow, I have a small amount of memory that's fast, of course, and a large amount of memory that's slow, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah, more general than that, though. Yeah. Yeah, these are all variants of what principle? Yeah. Make it into a cache, right? The, heart, the, the, the computer, the, the, the computer, a series of caches, right? I've got registers, I've got L1, L2, L3 caches. Now I've got a cache in memory, too. I've got a small amount of memory that I'm going to use to cache the contents. And I'm going to use the same cache management principles I use everywhere else. When something is accessed a lot, I, put it, I try to move it into that part of memory so that performance improves. When something is accessed less frequently, it's okay to put it in a slower part of memory. That was it. So, I don't, yeah, I guess, maybe, maybe people answer these questions based on word count, right? 
But that's another deceiving property I will point out. Actually, the longer the question is, the more likely it is that I've told you something about the answer in the question. So the short ones are the ones that get you. Yeah. Yeah. Use it as a cache. I think we accepted that answer for basically full points. All right. Two scheduling algorithms. How about three or four that we've talked about? What's one? Random. What's two? Non Robin. Three. Multi level feedback cues. Rotating staircase. There's four. Right? Not a, not a difficult question. OK. I think we have one more of the short answer. And then we get to my favorites. Yeah, I'm not even going to go through. Well, uh, OK. Jeez. Jeez. <laughs> this is the part of the exam where you can rest your brain a little bit. right? These questions are not designed to be that hard. OK. Um, so here's my process. Page table, like I said before, because I'm the nicest person on earth, I always use base 10 arithmetic on these. Nothing has changed this year. I haven't gotten any meaner. Um, and so I've got 100 byte pages. There's my page table. Um, you know, I've got permissions in there. I've got a physical page number. I have a virtual page number. And it just asks you to translate these addresses, right? So let's do one of them together. Uh, a store to address 365,004. What is the virtual page number? I do assume you can separate base 10 numerals uh, into their significant figures. 365,000 byte pages. This is the offset. So 365 is my virtual page number. Uh, what is that map to? 8,308. That's my uh, physical page number. And do I have permission to store a value to this address? Yes, it's RWE. OK, so what results is a store to address 8,308,004. Does that make sense? Not particularly. This, this year's is a little more interesting, uh, but not terribly, terribly interesting. So whatever. Uh, you guys will get it. Um, OK, any questions about this? I, yeah. What's that? What's E under permission? Execute. That comes in handy when I'm doing a fetch, right? So fetch is going to fetch and execute something, a byte, from that particular address. It's a good question. All right, onward. OK, so there will be two long answer questions of which you are free to choose one. Please don't answer both of them. So last year's, OK. So the first one was about smartphone interactivity detection. We had discussed inter we've discussed interactivity detection in class in terms of, and so, so what, first of all, I think the first part of this problem is, so, so one piece of advice, and the TAs definitely noticed this last year while grading the midterms, follow the instructions, OK? These questions have first, second, Next, you know, I mean, you can circle the parts of the question you need to answer. It's amazing how many people don't even bother doing that. They just ramble about something sort of semi-related to the question. But it's very difficult to assign them points because they didn't do the things that we asked them to do. So please just follow. The questions are very clear. In fact, this year there's even points embedded in the question so you know how we're going to, to grade them, you know what you need to do. So please just make sure you complete, complete the question. So first, describe the interactivity detection problem and explain why this information is generally important to thread scheduling. You want to take a, take a run at that? Yeah. So what is, OK, so what is interactivity detection? Broadly speaking, there are two types of tasks going on on your system. Interactivity detection is distinguished between, yeah, you want to continue? Right, so, so what are interactive threads doing? Yeah. No, no, that's, that's a heuristic that we use to try to figure out which ones they are. 
From a high level, what are they doing? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, even higher level than that. Very simple answer to this question. Yeah. Well, they could be doing that. They might not be. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Something you're going to notice, right? They're interacting with you. They're, they're doing something that you're going to notice if it slows down. All the things you guys mentioned are examples of that, but they're threads that are somehow involved in communicating with you or that are somehow you know, driving information to your eyeballs. Okay? A thread that's going in the background and doing a bunch of reorganization of your disk, it's not typically something you're going to notice unless you're sitting there staring at that disk defrag screen for some reason. Right? Um, anyway, the point is that if the thread is involved in some way, okay, now, the, you know, the, the fact that this is the interactivity detection problem should maybe give you a hint that something, saying something like, oh, the thread is sleeping a lot is not high level enough, right? The, what makes this challenging is it's very hard to determine which tasks are which. It's very easy to think about it. Conceptually, it's not a hard distinction to make, but from the perspective of the system, given the information the system has available, it's very difficult to determine, right? OK, so um, two reasons why interactivity, interactivity detection could be even more important on mobile smartphones. Tell me why this problem is important on mobile devices. Yeah. Exactly, right? So one big reason is the, these are battery-constrained devices. So if I make a bad decision and I allow a thread that you don't, a task, a, pro a process that you don't even notice to do all sorts of work that's not, that you're, not inter you're not interacting with, you don't understand it's happening, then you're going to pull your phone out. First of all, it's going to get warm, of course. You're going to know something's wrong because you have this little pocket warmer all of a sudden. And then you're going to pull it up, and the battery is going to be almost dead, and it's noon, right? And that's when something has gone wrong. Right? There, you know, I have made a mistake. There was all this activity going on. You didn't even notice. Right? So that's one reason. Um, the other reason is simply that, you know, another possible reason would be simply that people uh, spend a lot of time interacting with these devices, right? I pull out my phone. I want to check my email. I do that quickly. I put it back in my pocket, right? I don't spend a lot of time staring at it. It has this sort of passive role a lot of the time. Right. Uh, you know, with my email client or with some interactive thing on my desktop, if it takes a little longer to deliver a notification, that's okay. Right. With the phone, when I'm interacting with it, I may be trying to put it away as soon as possible. I hope that's what you guys are doing, right? rather than like navigating through the hall, staring at it. Or whatever, right? You might walk into something. Um, okay, so, so now consider how the differences between smartphones and traditional devices affect the interactivity detection problem and propose a new approach to interactive detection that responds to these differences. So it asks you to compare with traditional devices. So, what's, what's, so what are some of the things that are different about smartphones from traditional devices, other than the things we've already talked about? The things we've already talked about are problems, right? The device runs out of battery too soon. What are some opportunities that I might be able to take advantage of on smartphones to improve interactivity detection. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a great point, right? Smartphones, because they have a smaller screen, there's just one thing that I'm doing at a particular time. So an easy, like a really super easy heuristic is like, and this is actually something that Android does, whatever's in the foreground, meaning it's painting the screen, um, is the thing that gets higher priority. On a desktop, you know, I've got two monitors that are that wide. Who knows? The desktop doesn't know what I'm looking at. The smartphone does. There's only one thing that's painting the screen. Right? So that's, that's one uh, thing that, that the solution, we gave people credit for noticing. What are, but what are some other things? Yeah, Diana. Oh, 
Okay, so yeah, it's, it's possible that the, t well, the touch screen, you could probably map mouse events to touch screens, but I think uh, you're headed in the right direction here. Smartphones have some capabilities that typical devices don't have. They have cameras on them, sort of by default. They know where they are. They have sensors that can detect orientation and other things. So on some level, there is a lot more information available to smartphones that you could potentially plug into this problem. By default, your laptop doesn't have a GPS chip. Maybe some of them do now, but most of them might not. By default, you know, fancy laptops have, I guess maybe all laptops now have forward-facing cameras, but you know, in the past they haven't. Desktops, a lot, still a lot of them don't. So these were some of the differences we were asking you guys to notice. And if you noticed them, you didn't really have to talk. We weren't asking you to come up with the next latest, greatest scheduling algorithm. We just wanted you guys to see some of the opportunities and challenges of doing interactivity on this class of device. Any questions about this problem? All right. Um, let's look at the second question. OK, so jumbo pages. Oh, I think we got about to the same point last year with VM. So this question should be something you guys should be able to think about. So jumbo pages. Um, we talked about 4K pages. That's been a very traditional page size. But there are systems now that are starting to support larger pages. Um, First, explain why and in what cases 64K pages would improve or degrade OS performance. So what's the, it, so give me a case where they're going to improve performance. I think we actually talked about this in classes. Yeah. What's, yeah, so what's the general principle here, right? Bigger pages are going to be good if there's a certain property that holds. Yeah. So in general, spatial locality helps me if, if I use one byte on a particular page, What's the probability I'm going to use all the other bytes on that page? Imagine one byte pages. With a one byte page, the probability that I'm going to use another byte on that page is, well, zero, because I already used the one byte that I used to get it in, but essentially 100%, right? I use one byte, I use every byte on the page. With an infinitely sized page, the probability I'm going to use every other byte is zero. Every other size in between, there's some trade-off. So with pages like ones that might be used to store video or audio, the, the data is so big, you know, a page might only store less than a second of a high-def video. So what's the probability the user is going to hit pause right in the middle of that page? Very small. Clearly, when I hit pause, I'm going to be on some page. But even if I'm using 64K pages, the probability is very, very high that once I hit one byte on that page, I need the whole thing. So I shouldn't have it broken up into eight pages. So, okay, so, and, and this is essentially the uh, answer to the second question, part of this question, which is what information about virtual memory use could help the OS decide whether to locate content on a jumbo or regular size page? And what I want to know are the access patterns on that page, so the spatial locality on that page. That's not necessarily information that the OS can gather, We'll talk about that a little bit after midterm week, but it is the information that I would want. I want to know what the probability is I'm going to use one or more other bytes on that page. Ide ideally, the entire page. Second, explain how in certain cases you can implement jumbo page-like functionality on top of an existing system that supports 4K pages without changing the underlying memory management hardware. So you're, 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 like, you know, you're, you're working at this silly software company. Your boss, he's not going to actually be able to change the hardware. Right? We, pretend you have an MMU that only supports 4K pages. 
how can you get jumbo page like functionality without actually having jumbo pages? Right, whenever I get a page fault, right, actually, sorry, a TLB fault in a particular region, I load a bunch of other pages. While I'm in the process of paging in that particular page, I also grab a, bun a bunch of other pages. So when a page has been swapped out, when I have a hit inside a particular super page region that consists of 16 pages, I get every other page as well. Does that make sense? Actually, technically, this is a little more flexible than 64K pages because I can get, you know, eight pages on either side of the page that was faulted. I don't even have to break it up in this very static way. I can just grab a little bit of data before and after. Um, so what benefits of jumbo pages are preserved or lost? So what MME features are required for this to work? I think the answer was essentially I need to be able to see um, TLB faults. No, I don't remember. I'll have to look at, the, look at the solution. Which benefits of jumbo pages are preserved or lost by your approach? What benefit is preserved? That's what we just talked about. So I should reduce the fault rate. Because when I get one fault, if the other pages around that page were actually really needed, if I go get them, it means that the process is not going to fault again for a couple of more pages. That's good. But what's the real reason, potentially, at the MMU level to use jumbo pages? What's a benefit that I'm going to lose if I really don't have jumbo page support in the MMU and in the TLB? Yeah. Yeah, the translation speed will be the same. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can implement contiguity if I want to. What was our other trade off with page size? Excuse me. Yeah, es essentially remember, the trade-off with page size was page size too small, lot, great spatial locality, can't map very much memory with a fixed size uh, TLB. Page size too big can map a lot of memory, but very little spatial locality. And so the benefit of 64K pages is that one TLB entry can now map 16 times more memory than with the traditional 4K page. If I use this hacky way of preloading entries into the TLB based on fault behavior and surrounding pages, I lose that benefit. I might, but you know, I gain the other ones. Okay, questions about this question. All right, um, any other general questions about this exam? I will go over. I will switch to one of the 2013 exams for just the last five minutes. Uh, what is this? Yep. Okay. What do you guys want to see? Short answer? Long answer? Okay. Nothing? <laughs> All right. Long answer. Ah, okay, cool. Uh, so this is 2013. Uh, the, the first question has to do with being able to predict wait times. So remember when we were talking about schedulers, one of the things we wanted to know was when a thread sleeps, how long is it going to sleep? So this question asks you to think about a couple of different ways to do this. Right? Very quickly, what are, what are some cases in which thread sleep times might be extremely predictable? Remember, when I put a thread on a wait queue, it's waiting for something to happen. What are cases where I might be able to predict how long that thing's going to take? What are some events that would land a thread on a red queue that I'd probably be able to predict how long it's going to take? Yeah. What's that? Okay, I want to, and it's a little more specific. That's not, what's that? Okay, this, that's interesting. I could potentially try to use the past to predict the future here, but in certain cases I have threads that might be doing a variety of different things with different distributions or can all get combined. Let's say I just want to know something about what it's doing. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so certain things on your system are probably something that you can model. One thing would be disk I.O. So is there going to be some variance in disk I.O.? Yeah, of course, because other uh, threads and processes are also using the disk. But it's likely that if I know how long the disk queue is, I might be able to guess. And, and certainly I can produce a bound. I can probably say it's, vi you know, it's very likely that this thread will wake up within this amount of time. What's another, like, what's a really simple example here? Yeah. Okay, so it's a lock. What's that? Okay, yeah, I like the second answer better. Locks, not so much, because that depends on other threads. Oh, a clock, sorry, okay, yeah, timer, right? If it's waiting for a timer to go off, at that point I know exactly how long it's going to wait. Right? So that I don't have to do any prediction at all, right? Yeah, sorry, I was like, a lock, oh, that's weird. Um, clock, yes, if it's waiting for a timer, great. What are some cases where this would be highly unpredictable? Or I might as well just give up and not even try. Yeah. Way down the user, duh, what else? Yeah. Network traffic, not, not going to be doable. You know, depends on the quality of the website that you're visiting. Um, okay, so if I could have this information, how would I incorporate it into a scheduling algorithm? Let me give you an example. Let's have a really, really high priority thread. It goes to sleep. What do I want to ensure? It's the highest priority threat in the system. Yeah, I, I want to be there when it wakes up, right? Immediately. I don't want to have another thread in the middle of some big timer quantum that I've set up. I want to be ready, right? So ideally, for example, as it, the time that it's waking up is approaching, what I want to do is I want to schedule a thread to run right until the point where it's going to wake up. So when that thread th context switches out, literally the moment that the high priority thread gets back from the wake queue, it is immediately chosen by the scheduler. So essentially I want the scheduling process to happen as soon after it gets off the wake queue as I can. That, you know, that, that's, that's one of the examples. I think there was there were maybe one other one. Okay. Okay. Uh, last but not least, um, this. Well, I don't think we did. We talk about this this year. This is one of the lectures I didn't give. Something I skipped over. I'm not sure we really talked about threading models. Um, so actually, I think we did, but I don't. Know. I don't really care. You you can look up this this question um, in the solution. I don't think I spend as much time on this particular problem this year. All right, we have a couple minutes left. Any general questions? I'm really going to discuss this. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh. I mean, if you guys asked during an exam, the TAs would tell you what those instructions did, right? I don't expect you to have memorized the entire MIPS instruction set. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the exams I give are, are, I try to be as conceptual as possible, right? I'm, other than every year, the stupid plug and chug VM translation example, uh, the rest of the exam is really aimed at getting you to think and not regurgitate like random stuff that you from a MIPS data sheet that you forgot to memorize. Right? So yeah, that wasn't really the point of, of, of that question. But it's, it's fair. Right? The, the goal of the midterm is to be fair. I don't want to, I don't want to penalize people because they didn't memorize some silly thing. I mean, there are things you need to know, but yeah, there are things that we've covered in class. All right, any other questions? Good luck. So the process will be the same as the preterm. Um, we will get in here early. We'll have exams on seats. There'll be a seating chart an hour beforehand. Uh, please plan on leaving coats in the back or in the front. 
and we will start once a reasonable number of people are seated and ready to go. I will see you on Wednesday.